Peter Lynch is one of my favorite investors to listen to. Not only did he make almost 30% per year during his time running Magellan, but he also breaks down complex ideas into simple to understand tips. And this 1994 lecture from Peter Lynch that we're gonna take a look at today has so many timeless clips that are particularly valuable during a volatile stock market like we're seeing today. And if you enjoy these kinds of breakdowns, the best way you can show me is by leaving a like on the video and hitting subscribe if you want to stay up to date with content that I post in the future. But with that said, let's jump into it. This video is sponsored by ShareSite, a comprehensive portfolio tracking tool that automatically tracks the performance of your investments so you can say goodbye to Excel spreadsheets forever. Use my referral link in the description below or head directly to sharesite.com forward slash Hamish Hodder to try ShareSite for free or receive four months of a yearly subscription. The single, uh, single most important thing to me in the stock market for anyone is to know what you own. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. They, they would not be able to tell you why they own it. They couldn't say in a minute or less why they own it. Actually, if you really press them down, they'd say the reason I own this is the sucker's going up. I mean, that's the only reason. <laughs> that's the only reason they own it. And if you can't explain, I'm serious, you can't explain to a 10-year-old in two minutes or less why you own a stock, you shouldn't own it. And that's true, I think, about 80% of people that own stocks. And this is the kind of stock people like to own. This is the kind of company people adore owning. This is a relatively simple company. They make a, a very uh, narrow, easy to understand product. They make a one megabit SRAM, CMOS, bipolar risk, floating point, data IO, IO array processor, with an optimizing compiler, a 16 dual port memory, a double diffused metal oxide semiconductor monolithic logic chip, with a plasma matrix vacuum fluorescent display. It has a 16-bit dual memory. It has a Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicone emitter, a high bandwidth, that's very important, six gigahertz, <laughs> double metallization communication protocol, an asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four-wave interleave memory, a token ring interchange backplane, and it does in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you own a piece of crap like that, <laughs> you will never make money. Never. Before we get into some clips where Peter Lynch talks about some of his tips for investing during volatile markets, this clip is really, really important as a foundation. And I've spoken about this many times, but if you don't understand the businesses that you're investing in, then it really doesn't matter what the market is doing. You're probably not going to do very well over the long run. And this is for two key reasons. One is if you don't understand the businesses you're investing in, then you're not going to be able to identify the ones that you want to hold over the long term and that will likely uh, drive a significant return for your portfolio. And then on the other side, there's the psychological reasoning, which is markets are volatile. So if you don't understand what you own, when that stock price is moving around a lot, whether it's going up 20%, down 20%, you won't know uh, how to react, whether you should be buying more, whether you should be selling that stock, what you should be doing and how to manage that investment. You won't know what to do. And that's probably the most difficult part of investing is the psychology of holding onto great companies over time and how many great investors are able to hold onto great companies even after they go down significantly many times over multiple decades is because they deeply understand the business. So they recognize that the decline in the stock price is a short-term event that doesn't impact its true value. So if you're looking to invest in individual companies, the best place to start is by thinking about the areas that you already have an understanding in. Maybe it's because you have hobbies in that area, or you have just a particular interest in it, or maybe you have a career in that particular area, or you used to have a career in that area, start in those places and learn as much as possible and become an expert in certain areas. And that way you will be able to identify investment opportunities in those industries. And that's a distinctly different approach than to say, screen for cheap stocks and then just try and learn about pharmaceuticals all of a sudden, or all of a sudden you're gonna become an expert in oil when you there's people who've been studying oil for many, many years. For me, at least, it's been a much better approach to figure out which areas I understand, deeply understand those areas, and learn more about them over time, compound my understanding in a few areas, and then invest in those areas consistently. There's a lot of times people buy on the basis, the stock has gone down this much, how, you know, how much further can it go down? I remember when Polaroid went from 130 to 100, people said, here's this great company, great record, if it ever gets below 100, you know, just buy every share, you know, and it did get below 100. A lot of people bought on that basis saying, look, it's gone from 135 to 100. It's not 95, what a buy. Within a year, it was 18. 
And this is a company with no debt. I mean, this is a company that was just so overpriced, it went down. Uh, I did the same thing in my, uh, I think my first or second year of Fidelity. Kaiser Industries had gone from $26 a share to 16 I said, how much lower can it go? It's 16 It went to 6 it went to 5 it went to 4 it went to 3 And at 3 I figured out, you know, there's something very wrong here because Kaiser Industries owns 40% of Kaiser Steel, they own 40% of Kaiser Aluminum, they own 32% of Kaiser Cement, they own Kaiser Broadcasting, they own Kaiser Sand and Gravel, Kaiser Engineers, they own Jeep, they own business after business, and they had no debt. And they, what they did is they gave away all their shares to their shareholders. They, they passed out shares in Kaiser Cement, they passed out shares in Kaiser Aluminum, they passed out their public shares in Kaiser Steel, they sold all the other businesses, and you get about $50 a share. And, but if you didn't understand the company, if you're just buying on the fact the stock had gone from 26 to 16, and then it got to 10, what would you do when it went to 9? What would you do when it went to 8? What would you do when it went to 7? Lynch makes a couple of points here, but they can really be summarised into the value of a business doesn't always reflect and is certainly a different thing from the stock price of a business. And sometimes those two things will line up, uh, but more often than not, uh, people will be overly optimistic about a business's future and therefore its stock price will uh, be higher than what that business is actually worth, what that business can actually deliver to you in terms of cash, in terms of a return. Or it's the opposite. It's people being overly pessimistic about the business, likely because there's been some kind of uh, negativity or poor performance in the recent past. People tend to enjoy uh, extrapolating, particularly the last three to six months uh, over the next five years, which is absolutely insane. But again, this all just, again, comes back to understanding the business. If you know what the business is worth, then you can determine uh, how you should be acting when Mr. Market offers you a certain price for the stock. If you know a business is worth 100 and the market is offering it to you for 20, then that's an amazing deal. You don't have to panic about, oh, well, it was just 40. Why did it fall 50%? If you know what it's worth, then you can just accept the deal in the market and know that over the long run, you'll likely do very, very well. There's always something to worry about. And the key organ in your body in the stock market is your stomach. It's not the brain. If you can add 8 and 8 and get reasonably close to 16, that's the only level of math you need to know. You don't know to need the area under the curve. Remember that quadratic equation and a, an integral calculus and the area under the curve. I mean, whoever cared what was under the damn curve. I mean, you know, <laughs> but you had to study this. You don't need this in the stock market. So all you have to know is you're going to see it's always going to be scary. There's going to be always something to worry about. And you just have to forget all about it. Cut it all out and own good companies or own turnarounds. Study them and you'll do well. I love this quote from Peter Lynch here because it's true. Your stomach in investing is very, very important. It might be more important than your brain. I think both are important, although when we say brain, I don't think we really mean IQ. It's just uh, how you approach the market. Certainly, there's strategy and, and the need to know a lot about how certain businesses function. And that's not something that I think anyone can just pick up immediately. It obviously takes time to become good at that. But stomach is very, very important because even if you're investing in amazing companies, uh, a really important concept to understand is during a market crash, the actual value of your portfolio could be significantly higher than the number that you're seeing on the screen in your brokerage account. So you essentially need to be okay with seeing that account number fluctuate. And at the same time, you need to know what the value of your portfolio is. And if you know what the value of your portfolio is, then really you will be okay with seeing that number fluctuate in the short term. And you know that that's just a reflection of market volatility and not a change in your actual kind of net worth, if that makes sense. The value of the businesses, not as they are reflected in the short term, but uh, as they will be if you hold them over time. And one way really to be okay with it is just to not look. I mean, <laughs> there's other asset classes where you don't get an up-to-date real-time value or price of uh, your assets, uh, housing is, is in property is one of them, right? You don't really know what the value of your property is on an everyday basis. And that's probably a very, very good thing because uh, you're planning on holding that property over the long run. And it really doesn't matter what the difference is between someone willing to buy your property today versus tomorrow if you're not planning on selling that property for many years. Right. It's very important. There's another one of these numbers you ought to write down. If you put $1,000 in a stock, all you can lose is a thousand. I've done that several times. And uh, but if you're right, you can make five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand. So this business, you don't have to be right one out of two times. You can be right one out of four. It's a long time. 
the times you're right, you know the company's doing well, you know they're doing a great job, and you add to it, or at least you don't sell it, which is a terrible tragedy. So you can make more money on the upside. So I just, I just wrote those out. Investing is a game where you will be wrong more often than you're right. And more importantly than that, you can be wrong more often than you're right and still do extremely well over time. I think the question here is uh, how often are you right versus wrong and what happens in both of those situations? What kind of return do you make uh, and what kind of loss do you make in those circumstances? For most investors uh, who are speculating on businesses they don't understand, they will inevitably be wrong on most businesses and in all likelihood they will lose most of, if not all, of their initial capital, their initial investment on those losses. And that same average investor, when they finally do hit a, an investment that does well, maybe a one out of 10 that does reasonably well, uh, they tend to want to take gains uh, relatively quickly. And what that means on balance is that the losses will stack very heavily in the portfolio and the gains will stack very lightly in the portfolio, ultimately meaning overall you don't do very well. As a value investor, however, we're looking to preserve our capital first. So by investing in great companies and only buying them when they are priced far below what they're actually worth, we're protecting our downsides so that when we are wrong about a business, it tends more to be that we overestimated their ability to grow uh, rather than us being uh, investing into a business that was overly risky and had too much debt and actually ended up uh, not surviving in the industry. It's why we focus so much on businesses with deep competitive advantages first, because even if they don't grow in the future in the way that we expect, maybe competition is a little bit more than we expected. If they have a solid footing with their customer base, something unique, then their revenue and their cash flows are likely to be preserved over time. And that means that our invested capital, our investment, our, our initial investment can also be preserved over time. And also as a value investor, we want to hold businesses over the long term. Our favorite holding period is forever. That's a quote from Warren Buffett. And that essentially means that if we do... Are we, if we are correct about a business and it ends up growing significantly, maybe more than we expect, we're willing to hold on to that business. And that means that we can uh, receive the full benefit of that investment over time. And we don't lock in gains after it's gone up 50% or 100%. So as long as you're making a few smart bets over time, those bets can be mostly wrong as long as you don't lose big on those investments. And when you do win, you let them run, you let them blossom. I think another Peter Lynch quote that he doesn't talk about in this interview is that uh, people too often want to, uh, they, they cut the flowers and water the weeds, right? They take gains uh, too early on great companies and they shove money into losing stocks. And that's actually the opposite generally of what you want to be doing. If you want to see more videos like this from me, then make sure you let me know by leaving a like on the video and hit subscribe if you want to stay up to date with content that I post in the future. But with that said, hope you guys have a great day. See you in the next one.